Hi, I'm Greg Lefebvre, and this is The Compulsive Storyteller, a series of short personal stories where we explore the idea that truth can be stranger than fiction. In this week's episode, entitled A Wrench in the Works, I go back to school, namely my high school in Utica, New York, where the spirit of civil disobedience and group actions flourish. My group takes part in a movement to fight the system, and in particular, the cruel and unjust assistant principle for discipline. A Wrench in the Works All the names in this story have been changed. For some like me, high school is the last bastion of freedom before being drafted into the workaday world. Or maybe it's better put as the world of the wage slave. It's a place where you can choose not to do your homework, choose not to conform, and even choose to consciously break the rules of the school authorities. Most high school students never think this way, never ask the larger questions about what goes on in a big high school and why. There are a few of us, though, who do ask the bigger questions and decide that some form of civil disobedience is called for. And because our school's student body consists of a large percentage of first- and second-generation immigrant working-class youth who don't necessarily share all the typical American values, there are many who sometimes choose to follow our lead. Everyone else thinks we're just wise guys or troublemakers or anarchists. Along with 2,200 other students, I go to Utica Free Academy, which sounds a bit like a private school, but believe me, it is not. It actually occupies a building that was originally a cotton factory. Now, instead of turning out factory products, it turns out mostly future factory workers. There's been a long-standing antagonism at the school between the authorities and parts of the student body. This has at times resulted in a host of repressive measures on the part of the administration, including expulsions without due process, spying on students, and outright physical abuse. For this reason, the school's been the site of a series of spectacularly well-organized, coordinated student disobedience actions during my time here. UFA, like most big high schools, has an assistant principal for discipline. Ours is particularly nasty and vindictive. He likes to walk the hallways, swinging his long keychain. I don't know if it's true, but I've heard he's a former cop. He has a reputation for physically abusing kids who cross him. I once saw him pushing around a new freshman, called a greenie by the upperclassmen. They're sometimes ambushed in the hallway to have lipstick smeared all over their faces. Because the victim in this case refused to tell the assistant principal who had done the lipsticking, the assistant principal starts roughing up the kid. If we hadn't have come along, there's no telling how far he would have gone to get a confession from a victim, no less. The assistant principal has been around for many years, so who knows, he may be a big part of the reason for the difficulties between the authorities and certain parts of the student body. Needless to say, he is unpopular with almost everyone. The school is set back about 100 feet from the street. Between the two entryways, there is a grassy square surrounded by a three-foot-tall pipe rail fence. On this particular afternoon, the assistant principal's VW Beetle is parked in its usual spot on the street. We have all already practiced lifting one of the kids' parents' VW, which is not hard to do with enough students. So a dozen of us, including myself, simply pick up the car, lift it up, and pass it over the fence to a similar-sized group inside the fence. Then we all carry it to the middle of the grassy square. Word of our action has spread, and there is a sizable crowd outside waiting for the assistant principal to leave work. He comes out the door, calmly observes the large crowd in the position of his VW, and goes back in again. We're thinking to call the cops, but we're wrong. Within a few minutes, he emerges from the school, this time leading the entire football team who've been at practice behind the school. They all step over the fence and huddle with the assistant principal in the middle. Then they lift out his vehicle, which is safely placed back on the street without so much as a scratch. All the onlookers leave, disappointed. The next morning, a message comes over the PA system from the principal. 
which brings jeering laughter from my homeroom. He tells all classrooms that the administration knows exactly who took part in moving the VW, and that if they step forward and confess, they will not be expelled. I'm amazed that over the next couple of weeks, no one informs on us, and the whole episode is forgotten, probably because the assistant principal sees it as a win and decides to let his victory stand as is. But then things start to happen to the ringleaders and others. Tires deflated, locker combinations mysteriously not working, and lockers foamed. That's where the nozzle of an aerosol shaving can or whipped cream is shoved through the louvers of a locker to fill it with foam. I'm sure the assistant principal didn't do any of these things, but most probably he helped facilitate them. One of our group, who was home from school on the day the VW was moved, was accosted by the assistant principal when he was walking alone in the hallway. He calls him over and whispers in his ear, I know it was you. Then doubles the kid over with a punch in the solar plexus and walks away. His intelligence gathering skills need some work, we decide. In the spring of my sophomore year, there are elections for the following semester's student council officers. My friend and comrade-in-arms Nick Dardano because of his popularity with other students, manages to get enough names on a petition to become a candidate for the student council president. At an all-school assembly, he is presenting last of the four candidates, three of whom pour out all this dribble about the august traditions of UFA, striving for excellence, and living the academic life to its fullest. It's as if they all hired the same speechwriter. In front of a packed gymnasium, Nick steps up to the podium and after taking a long and wide yawn directly into the microphone, excuses himself and begins. What this election really needs is a little humor. Then he goes on, did you hear about the 80-year-old guy who asked his wife, let's go upstairs and have sex? And she responded, do you think we can do both? There's a scattering of laughs because many of the students don't get the joke at first. Then more laughter and some applause, Nick smiles. He continues, What's French has two thumbs and loves a good blowjob. The word blowjob causes a murmuring gasp from the audience. Nick then stands tall, proudly points back at himself with both his extended thumbs and says, Moi. Thunderous laughter and applause and whistles, but by then, the powers that be have closed in and are attempting to get the microphone away from Nick. His last words over the mic are, Come on, I saved the best one for last. And then the audience begins to chant, Dardano, Dardano, Dardano. The elections are canceled because the authorities know that Nick will win. Then they get smart and call for another volunteer assembly after school hours. Disrupting an assembly during school hours is one thing, but staying after, we all think, no way. They present the same roster of candidates, less one, to a sparsely attended after-school assembly, which is, in Nick's words, every brown-nosed, boot-licking, mama's boy, college prep conformist, and ass-kissing teacher's pet in the whole school. Nick's humorous election speech was just the beginning of a world of trouble for him. Firstly, he receives a temporary suspension for two weeks. His father then takes up his cause, asking the authorities, Where does it say in the school regulations that a student can't tell an off-color joke at an assembly? And if it's not a rule, how can he be summarily eliminated from the election and kicked out of school? It's only after his father talks about hiring a First Amendment lawyer that his suspension is revoked. On his first morning back to school, the assistant principal calls him out of class into the hallway to warn him. I'm watching you, buddy, so you better be very careful how you behave. At this point, Nick starts to get a little paranoid and definitely curtails his activities, so the assistant principal's warning did work. But at the same time, he's become a celebrity of sorts, walking around the hallways and getting high fives and thumbs up along every corridor wherever he goes. There are other moves made by the administration at this time that upset large parts of the student body. For example, three cheerleaders are dismissed from the team because they altered their cheerleading uniforms. We could never find out exactly how their uniforms were altered, but out they went. Emboldened by our success with the VW, 
The next action involves the entire student body. For a few days, word goes around that today everyone has to place a wind-up alarm clock in their locker, set for 1.15. At exactly that moment, we all await the thunderous ringing of thousands of alarm clocks. We can barely hear the few alarm clocks nearest our classroom's doorways. Each clock's sound is muffled by each locker, and our plan is a complete fiasco. Afterwards, I wonder, if we did a dry run for the VW, why not the same thing for the alarm clocks? Intuitive thinking gone completely wrong. At the beginning of our junior year, the civil rights movement is very much in the news, and there is talk that the assistant principal has it in for black kids in the school. Different groups of kids sometimes hang out together at different doorways of the school. One is the college preps, one the immigrant kids, mostly Italians and Poles, one the jocks, one the black kids, and so on. Like much of segregation back then, most white kids don't question or think about it at all. Apparently, many of the black kids have stories about the assistant principal, but none are willing to share them with us. One thing I noticed, though, is that if there is ever trouble at the door where the black kids hang out, the assistant principal is quick to call the cops, which he never does if there is trouble at any of the other doorways. It isn't until the end of my junior year that we try our next action. At UFA, there are study halls which are three times the normal size of a classroom, supervised by a single teacher. All of our group have managed to get assigned to the same study hall. While the supervising teacher works at her desk in front of the hall, a dozen screwdrivers are passed from student to student, and each carefully unscrews all the screws in their desk so that each desk is standing up just by the force of gravity alone. When the bell rings, everybody gives a little push, and all the desks fall to pieces. It makes quite a sound, and there's lots of laughter. Then outside in the hallway, all the screwdrivers are collected by one member of our group, so if we're searched, there's no physical evidence. Then in a stroke of genius, a number of us volunteer to help reassemble the desks, complaining the whole time about the idiots who did this. It is now my senior year, and we're fully back in action. On a Tuesday when school opens, students enter the library and each signs out ten books, the maximum amount allowed. By the end of the day, all the library shelves are empty. On Thursday, after the school opens, but before the library opens, everybody crowds around the return slot to return their books. Within minutes, the bin behind the slot is full, and people continue to place their books below the slot and make a huge overflowing pile, so large that it almost blocks the entire hallway. This time, the school authorities are done fooling around. There are no announcements or requests for confessions, but instead, most of our group are rounded up and detained in different empty classrooms, where school officials are waiting, headed up by the assistant principal for discipline. Then they use the old good cop, bad cop technique and offer immunity to some of the smaller fish, and eventually learn who the leaders are of our group, and all of them are summarily expelled from school, except me. I'm surprised, puzzled, and pleased that no one has informed on me. Sadly, though, that is my last action. My family moves away from Utica, and I never come back. I do wonder, from time to time, if our tradition of dissent continued in the following years. Since that time, the school's been combined with the other high school in Utica, and both have moved to a new campus with a new name. The building that housed all the events described here is now a nursing home. Today, thinking back on those days so long ago, I don't remember them quite so fondly. With 70 million MAGA followers in our country who have little or no respect for the law, I can't help but question our actions. Also in looking back, just like with Trump today, Maybe it was just one bad apple, the assistant principal for discipline, who was the root cause for many of the school's troubles. I've now come to the conclusion that in a democracy, demonstrating in the streets and making oneself heard at the ballot box are really the only way to go. But it sure was fun. Vince Ramos.
The Compulsive Storyteller is written by me, Greg Lefebvre, and co-produced with Peter Kakoma, who made our theme song. If you enjoyed this week's episode, we'd love your help sharing the show. Please subscribe to The Compulsive Storyteller for free on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you listen. And if you would leave a review, that would be fantastic. Follow the show on Instagram at The Compulsive Storyteller and check out our website for more information at thecompulsivestoryteller.com. Thanks for listening. And if you don't like this one, the next one will be another story.